Movie Volume 5 Chapter 1 Welcome to Haven has officially released, so let me break it down for you. So Crow and Team Ranger are reminiscing on the past events of Volume 4, having a good laugh about how Crow almost died, you know, a whole barrel of laughs that was. <laughs> But Crow decides to take the kids on a scenic route, where we are essentially given a recap on Mistral's World of Remnant. The place is diverse, stay away from the lower levels cause of shady people, higher levels, classy, also probably filled with shady people as well. Now for a brief moment, I was thrown off a bit by the 2D animation, but not in a bad way. I actually really loved it. It reminded me of something like out of the tail series. You also gotta love this couple right here. It's sweet, but if that's bamboo, that's not gonna hold its shape for too long. Bamboo grows fast. But the 2D was a welcome surprise. I was expecting something similar to what they did on Menagerie in Volume 4. But the sudden switch from 3D to 2D, it was a pleasant surprise, for me at least. Meanwhile, Weiss is still on the cargo ship. The pilot, down to help, so long as he's paid. But the important thing that I ended up gathering from this scene was all the events, specifically from Volume 4, were all happening, relatively speaking, at the same time. There were no stories that took place first, aside from probably Team Rangers. For the most part, they were all happening concurrently. Team Ranger just made it to Mistral, and now Weiss is right on their heels. Anyway, Weiss is still continuing to grow as a caring person and not a cold-hearted one. She hears the distress call and wants to help, but the logic of the pilot is pretty sound. This is a cargo ship. If we heard it, someone else is probably to have heard it as well. And this is my ship. It's a pretty sound argument, not gonna lie. I mean, I still think whoever they are are just gonna die, but it's probably irrelevant anyway. So back with Team Ranger, they are inside Haven Academy, where they realize that no one's there. Crow finds that suspicious and he kicks down the door to find Leonardo Lionheart. The real reason no one is in the academy is because class is dismissed. With no class, there's no students, and with no students, there's no teachers, and with no teachers, no one's guarding the relic. Which is what Lionheart presumably wants or is being forced to do. As of now, it's currently unknown as to whether or not Lionheart is in fact a villain or the cowardly lion too scared to stand up to Watts. Meanwhile, back on Menagerie, we see that everyone's a bit upset. Why? Well, as Blake tells us when talking to Ilya, they went to confront Corsic and Fenegalbe with the scroll that they had. And of course, they denied any and all accusations against them. And this is the continuing problem when it comes to Ruby, in which they continue to tell us as the audience of things that are happening. They aren't showing us. We confronted them with the scroll. Did you? I guess I'm just gonna have to take your word on it. I'd love to see the confrontation, but I guess I won't. So that's something I hope that they don't do as much this volume, and they show us a lot of events instead of tell us. Meanwhile, Ilya continues to warn Blake to leave Menagerie, but most likely, they're not gonna until something big happens. As of now, any guesses would just be a white fang assault on Menagerie, but we have to wait to find out. But let's jump to Yang real quick, since a whole lot of exposition happens with Lionheart. So Yang has stopped at a just right gas station for some refreshments. And when she goes to grab the water, you can see her hands start shaking. And thank God that they're doing this. It's a good start for her dealing with her PTSD. I hope it's a lot more than just a few shakes, but it was a good start for what should come. Meanwhile, the local cool guy starts harassing Yang. Much like a lot of the audience, this man is in disbelief by Yang's age. Despite how, um, mature Yang looks, dude gets a bit handsy and gets punched. Now that seemed a bit excessive. Not the fact that she punched him, that was perfectly justified. But the fact that she punched him so hard that he bounced off the floor and ceiling multiple times, that was a bit much. I'm a fan when a show has logical physics. You want to get hit so hard that you act like a meteorite and destroy the ground and destroy trees? Perfectly fine, I can believe that somehow. But when a human bounces off the ground and ceiling, I can't even get a bouncy ball to bounce that many times between the two. Somehow my suspension of disbelief ends up getting broken. What Yang has effectively done is killed this man. Every bone should be dust and every organ should be liquid at that point, and even then, he shouldn't bounce that much. But the owner is happy with Yang's excessive force and tells her to not go messing with the bandits. So yes, it appears as though Yang is tracking down her mother instead of Ruby. So as Yang is getting ready to leave, the man, who should be dead, appears to have a bit of information on Raven's tribe. Is he a part of it? Is he in a rival tribe? Or is he just a dick? We'll find that out later. So backtracking to Team Ranger, here's all the exposition that was given. So since the Vital Festival was broadcasted everywhere, everyone saw when Penny was killed. People panicked, people got scared, and that attracted large influxes of Grimm. Huntsmen died, and teachers died. I would say this one gets a pass of just being told what happens. I don't think there was a need to go back in time to show us what was happening when the Fall of Beacon began in Mistral. Anyway, the Maidens. As we know, there are relics. However, only the Maidens can unlock the relics. However, there's only one relic each Maiden can unlock. 
winter for creation, summer for destruction, fall for choice, and spring for knowledge. Only they can unlock their respective relic. So, everyone's clamoring to get their hands on a maiden before something bad happens. Crow, as we know, is aware that Raven is likely to have the spring maiden. But as Lionheart says, Crow and Raven are equally matched, so it's unlikely that he's capable of obtaining her. So it seems as though the two siblings have got a bit of a yin and a yang complex going on. Equally balanced, two sides of the same coin, semblances probably polar opposites. But Lionheart convinces them that they cannot do it alone and should stay in the town. They agree and leave. And wouldn't you know it, Watts was listening the entire time. You gotta love that Lionheart has a little icon for Watts as well. It's not just this mysterious nothing, it's like a logo. Yeah, he's gotta know who he's talking to. Also, Lionheart, being one smooth cat, copies the map that Crow shows to him, and no one in the room caught him. Lionheart's slick. So, obvious that he's gonna hand that information over to Watts or his associates so they can get the jump on the Spring Maiden themselves. So Crow leaves to get drunk where we see the after credit scene from Volume 4 where he meets Oscar. After proceeding to get even more drunk, he takes him back to their room where he reveals his kind of true self to everyone, that he is Ozpin. I find it interesting that the first thing that Oscar said to Ruby was about her silver eyes. It's as if Ozpin whispered to Oscar, hey tell her she has silver eyes, she'll get it, she'll know who we are. And then she didn't get it so he was just like, alright just tell him. Also super drunk Crow was great comedy. And then we get the theme song, which I feel as though kind of spoiled some stuff. I mean, if it's anything like the Volume 4 theme, it means nothing whatsoever. But who's this next to Cinder? Adam and Hazel are working together? Mercury's gonna be in this volume? It's small things, you know, nothing big, but I like to go into things completely blind. As for the episode as a whole, I think it was amazing. One of the things that I was worried about was I think Volume 4 felt a bit disconnected from the other volumes because of the animation change. So for me, it kind of felt standalone-ish and kind of like an outlier. But with this episode, it felt a lot more at home. Like, now we're supposed to look and feel like this. The episode, I think, had some great comedy, specifically from Nora. She was a lot more of her cheery self, which was great to see. As mentioned, Drunk Crow was unexpected but very welcome. But probably my biggest issue with the episode was the overly cartoony scene with Yang punching that guy. The episode had plenty of comedic moments without that. I just felt as though it was trying a little too hard to add comedy, because that to me did not seem badass in any way. For me, at least. I'm also really liking Lionheart, whether he's a villain or a good guy at this point, who knows. But just the way he and Crow talk to each other, it's like they got history, back in the day type stuff. But probably the biggest thing that I'm liking so far is the fact that I feel like the world is getting bigger. Being stuck in Vale for three volumes, all we got were mentions of the outside world as it were. But now actually being inside Mistral, the world feels as though it's expanded much more than Volume 4 ever felt. A lot of good feelings from Episode 1. Not all perfect, but a great start. So be sure to let me know what you guys thought of the episode down in the comments. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you're interested in more content like this, follow me on all social medias, and I'll see you in the next video.